I wish sometimes y'all could see what I see. Not that I've got any insight, but I see some people really worshiping the Lord uh, during the choir special. I was looking over old Chris here, just got right with God. I thought he, I was going to die. If didn't get, and then Brother Eddie here getting baptized this morning and went visiting with me yesterday and some people we visited back there. That's a blessing. And uh, just to see uh, the tears and the, and the open-heartedness. Listen, I'm going to tell you something, friend. We're not here to go through the motions. And the last time I checked, we're not here to leave, you know, except for another world. I was kidding Brother uh, Reed. I said, you know, you're going to the glory class, and the glory class is the last class. Yes. 
before glory. Amen. And I happened to be in that class, which I can't believe because I can't believe I'm there with all those elderly people. But, uh, uh, but we got blessed in Sunday school this morning. Brother Lamar taught, and it was a blessing. And uh, he, he, was, uh, he was just so sincere. I love sincerity. We worship in sincerity and truth. Well, our guest preacher is no stranger. He's been here several times, and uh, he pastored... Uh, down in Ackworth uh, for 22 years. That's a long time. And uh, when I met him uh, through Brother Austin Gardner, he was in Cedartown, George, I believe. Cedartown, Tallapoosa, somewhere around there. I think it's Cedartown. And uh, I've always admired Brother Reed's steadfastness yes, and faithfulness and his, um, his truthfulness towards the Word of God. Right. He, and he's, he's going to bring his books in tonight. He's got them in his garden. He's got some tremendous books on uh, Proverbs and, and on the fundamentals of the faith and some things that, you know, you need to read. And so I appreciate so much um, him being with us. And we prayed all week. We even had the, uh, we had somebody as a backup for him because he called me Wednesday and said that uh, he was having heart trouble. And, and I want to tell you something. This man is a miracle because the doctors gave up on him several times and said, you don't have many years, many months. And uh, people prayed for him. And I believe God has extended his life uh, to preach. And I'm so grateful he's able to be here this morning. You give him your undivided attention. Amen. And let's let God work in our hearts. Brother Reed, you come and preach. Thank you, Thank you my brother. Amen, brother. Okay. And Brother Cofield and I are part of a mutual admiration society. Because I certainly admire him. And thank the Lord for his... I think you've been here 40 years now, haven't you? I read about a, a Baptist church in New England some years ago that had one family pastoring it for 125 years. The dad pastored a little over 40 years, the son over 40 years, and then the grandson over 40 years. What a, what a legacy. And it's great to be here. I love coming here and to this church. It's beautiful. You've done a great job of redecorating getting things brightened and looking nice, and, and I love it. But most of all, what I love is not, not the church building itself. I, I just love the service. It's, I love going into an old-fashioned service where there's good singing. You don't have to be grieved, by the, grieved in the spirit before you ever get up to preach. My wife and I have been visiting, when I'm not preaching, visiting some churches and I don't know how, how it is in this area, but I'm going to tell you, in Atlanta, it's good. It's hard to find old-fashioned singing churches. In fact, we visited one here the other day. I, I failed to check it out before I went. I usually <laughs> check a church out, but I failed to check it out. We walked in and sat out, and they were nice. I mean, they were very nice and friendly and well-trained. The ushers were very well-trained and helped us out in a great way. And We got sit down. And then the service started. <laughs> I looked at my wife and I said, let's go. And I knew from the very beginning it just wasn't my, I just wasn't going to be able to worship there. And uh, so we got up. It was a big church, so nobody noticed us. We just, we just kind of eased out. And, and, but I'm glad to be here. It's wonderful to be here. Wonderful to be in the Lord's house. And I'm thankful. And I'm I'm going to try not to lift my voice a whole lot this morning because my voice is weak and it'll give out. And uh, I don't want to be dry. I think the greatest sin of a preacher is to be dry. <laughs> one of the greatest sins of a preacher is to be dry. I heard about one preacher. He was known for being dry. People went to sleep all the time. And, and uh, one day his notes flew out to Wyndon. And uh, they went out just out to the pasture land and a guy was watching there, and an old cow got his notes and ate them up, and the old cow dried up. And, uh, I'm telling you, some, some preachers are very, very dry. My hearing is very bad, so if I, I usually just respond like this, you know. I, so if you talk to me individually, I, that's the way I re respond, because my hearing is just about to go. Um, I heard about a guy that was out golfing. You ever golf? Uh, 
I used to like to golf. I don't golf anymore, but I used to. He was out golfing with a deaf fellow, and uh, they were golfing away, but the fellow in front of them was slow, and they had, kept having to wait on him, and they finally, the old deaf fellow just got fed up with it, and he asked, uh, he signed to the fellow with him, said, tell him to go on, tell him to let us play through. And the old fellow said, no, we're not going to let you play through. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm in my spot, I'm going to stay here. But he kept being slow. And so finally the old deaf fellow got tired of waiting. He stepped up to the tee and hit the ball and sure enough hit the guy right in the back of the head. The guy looked around. He was mad as an old wet hornet and the old deaf fellow was jumping up and down. <laughs> Doing just like that. <laughs> so if things don't get better for me, I'm going to take up sign language. I want you to turn to Isaiah 44. I appreciate your prayers for me. I've had some setbacks recently. And, and I was supposed to have another calf test this last Monday, and I was so weak this last weekend, I, didn't, I wasn't able to have the calf test, so we postponed that. And, uh, but I was praying I could be able to be here. I wanted to be with you folks. I, I love this church and love your pastor. And I love revival. And that's what I'm going to preach on here this morning. Isaiah chapter 44. And um, are y'all in the habit of standing for the Bible reading? Let's stand together, would you please? And let me read verses 3 to 5. Good to see our friends, Brother Killian. Miss Killian, special, special friends. I love him in the Lord. Isaiah 44, verse 3, For I will pour water upon him that's thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I'll pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand to the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. I want to speak to you this morning on a promise of revival. Let's pray together. May we, our Heavenly Father, I pray you would teach us how needy we are. And I pray you'd make us hungry for a moving of the Spirit of God. Amen. How our churches need it. How we personally need it, dear Lord. Fill me with thy spirit. And thank you, dear Lord, for strength. And I pray you'd help me and help the people. Help us to respond, dear Lord, and to be open to the Holy Spirit of God. And we'll thank you for it. In your name we ask it. Amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to talk to you for a few times during all this week about revival. The psalmist said, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Nations die without revival. Churches die without revival. I believe a church needs perennial revival or it begins to die. Anything living tends to die unless it's revived. Everything does. Churches tend to die without revival. And Christians tend to die. Movements tend to die. Revival's the need of the hour. It's the need of our country. Revival's not going to come in on Air Force One. It's not going to come in with a new president or a new Congress. Revival will only be brought by God's people. If my people, which are called by my name, God says. Revival is the need of the hour. But what is revival? What is it? Would we know it if we saw it? How would you describe it? Brian Edwards, who I think wrote the definitive work on revival for our day, a people saturated with God, he said, that is what revival really is. It's a people saturated with God. We're saturated with many other things. We're saturated with Hollywood. We're saturated 
with entertainment. We're saturated with having fun. We're saturated with being happy. But are we saturated with God? Revival is a people saturated with God. I read just yesterday about Benjamin Franklin when Whitfield came to America and he heard Whitfield preach. And after Whitfield preached, there was revival in Philadelphia and all about those parts. And Franklin said that you couldn't go anywhere without hearing psalm singing. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing families, the lights on in the, in the, um, uh, in the house and the families reading the scriptures and singing the songs of God. It was a people saturated with God. What is revival? It's a sweeping of the Holy Spirit amongst us to warm our cold hearts. It's the manifest presence of God among us. You know, there's three degrees to the presence of God. God is everywhere. In Him we live and move and have our being. David said, if I ascend up into heaven, behold, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. God is everywhere. He's not far from every one of us, even from the lost man. He's not far from every one of us. That's the first degree of the presence of God. And then God, when we're saved, comes into us. He is in our bodies. Know ye not that your body is the temple of of the Holy Spirit of God, which you have of God, and you're not your own. We call that the indwelling uh, presence of God. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. But then there's a third degree of the presence of God. The old men of God used to call it the felt presence. A.W. Tozer called it the manifest presence. It's when we know he's here. It's when God is moving and we're afraid of him. We're afraid to cross him. It's like what happened in Acts 2 and Acts on down to Acts 5 when God's presence came in such a way that if you did something wrong, something could happen and you knew it. And Nice and Savira were struck dead because they lied to the Holy Spirit. It's the manifest presence of God. I sense it most during a thunderstorm when God seems near. But I've sensed it in, in, in churches when I know it because God is convicting me. God is speaking to me. God is doing a work inside of me and others. Revival is the manifest presence of God. Revival is to a church what wind is to a sailing vessel, what a spark is to a gasoline engine. Charles G. Finney said revival is new obedience. It's things that I've just let slip, and all of a sudden God begins to show them to me. It's new obedience. Again, Charles G. Finney said revival is God's finger pointing at me. It's when I get my eyes off somebody else and God's finger turns away from what everybody else is doing to what I'm doing, how I'm keeping him back. Revival is new joy, new life, new lilt, new love. Bible conferences have to be advertised, but not revival. Revivals break out. When revival comes, you don't have to get on the radio and tell about it. People tell about it everywhere, what God is doing in their heart and in their life. Gospel meetings are promoted, and rightly so, and planned, but revivals are prayed down, and they're rarely ever organized. Somebody said revivals are when God's people wake up, they clean up, and they get up. They wake up because they've gone to sleep. In fact, they used to be called awakenings, the great awakening, the first great awakening, the second great awakening. It's when God's people wake up. They've gotten lethargic. They've they've gone to sleep. Revivals are when God's people wake up. And then they clean up. And they clean up because they've gotten dirty. They've allowed the little foxes to come in to spoil the vines, the little things to come into their lives. 
and then they get up because they've gotten lazy. Oh, that God would give us revival. That God would start the manifest presence of himself into us. I've often said, I I hope God will let me live long enough to see one community-wide revival. I've seen a church revival. I've seen churches get revived, but I've never seen a community revival. Oh, that God in our day and time in 2018 would bring a community-wide revival and perhaps even beyond that. Isaiah 44 gives a great promise of revival. It speaks actually to the scattered Jews, the judged Jews. It's the same promise of Joel, which was repeated in Acts chapter 2 by Peter when Peter said, about that manifest presence of God that had come. Peter said, this is that which was spoken by Joel the prophet. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your young men shall see visions and your old men dream dreams. And he went on and on. This is that, he said. This is that, what Joel talked about. This is what it is. It's a promise that God will gather the the, the, the dry bones of Israel and cause them to live again. It's actually a promise to Israel. It's a promise to revive them. And it speaks directly to Israel, but it can be applied, I think, to the church, which I think most of the promises of Israel can be applied to the church. And I want to look at three aspects of this revival promise this morning as we begin talking about revival. Number one, this is a promise of revival. I want you to notice it in verse 3. Look at it in your Bible. He said, I will pour water upon him that's thirsty. I will, again, he says, pour my spirit upon thy seed. Twice he says, I will. In fact, actually, there's three different times in that passage. He says, I will, I will, I will. This is the promise of revival. Listen now. It's not from, not from man, but it's from God. I will. I will. If I make a promise to you, then uh, I may be able to keep it. I may die before I could keep it. I may, I may keep it. I may not keep it. I want to keep it, but I may not be able to keep it. But when God makes a promise to us, God always keeps his promise. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? God knows what's in the future. He controls the future, and he never makes a promise he can't fulfill. God always does that with his promises. In the scriptures, there's conditional promises, and there's unconditional promises. Sometimes makes a, God makes a promise. It doesn't depend on anything that we do. God made a promise like that to Abraham. It was an unconditional promise. It's going to be fulfilled. But then there are some promises, many of them, in Scripture that are conditional. God says, I will do something if you will do something. That's one of those promises here, you see. If revival doesn't come, listen, if revival doesn't come, It will not be because God has not promised it. It will be because we don't fulfill the promises or the conditions that God has said. God made a promise to Abraham and Sarah. When Sarah heard that promise, she laughed. And God said, is there anything too hard for me? I think sometimes we think, Brother Eddie, you know that it's too hard in our day and time. People have gotten too busy. It's too hard to have revival now, but there's nothing too hard for God. I don't know how God would do it, but I just believe that God can still do it. Now unto Him it's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. This is a promise from God. Again, it's an unlimited promise. An unlimited promise. Not just a few drops of water. I'll pour water upon him that's thirsty, but floods upon the dry ground. Mercy drops round us are falling. 
but for the showers. That's what we're pleading for. That's what revival is. God's promise is not limited by his ability. It's only limited by our unbelief. Our unbelief. Jesus went to Galilee, to his home area. And the Bible says he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Twice in Scripture it says, according to your faith, be it unto you. God's promise of revival is not limited by His ability to give it. It's by our unbelief in His ability. In Matthew 17, they brought the lunatic boy to the disciples of Jesus while Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they tried every kind of formula in the world, I have no doubt. They repeated everything they had seen what Jesus said to try to cast that demon out of that boy, and nothing worked. Jesus came down and cast the demon out of that boy, and when those disciples saw it, they said, Lord, couldn't we do, why couldn't we do that? He said, because of your unbelief. Your unbelief, you see. Psalm 78, 41 says, Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Do you know God can be limited? That word there, I've got a whole message I preach on that, the limitation of God. It means to draw a line around. It's like the city limits. It's like a place. And, and God said you can actually draw, and, and Israel did. Israel drew a line on God when they got to the promised land. They wouldn't believe him. And God said to them, you limited the Holy One of Israel. God can be limited. You know, someday, I believe someday some church is going to believe God and God's going to pour out His blessings on them. And I don't think it'll be because they all have necessarily the exact correct doctrine. It's going to be because of something I'm going to show you here in just a minute. There's one condition that God puts upon having revival in these verses. And so, uh, number three it's a promise we know we can righteously pray for. We can claim it. Why? Yeah, are we not supposed to pray in God's will? Are we not supposed to find God's will and pray that way? Sure. Prayer's not getting my will done in heaven. Right. Prayer's getting God's will done on earth. Amen. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. I wonder how many of you here this morning have asked God to send revival this week. You have not because you ask not. I wonder how many of you have asked and believed God for certain things this week. God, I want to see something done. I want to see somebody saved. I want to see a specific individual saved. General prayer gets general answers. But specific prayer gets specific answers. You have not because you ask not. And you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Somewhere God's going to find a church, I believe, that's not interested in getting glory for itself. That's not interested in exalting and necessarily building itself but is interested only in the glory of God. And when he finds a church like that, he's going to pour out his blessing on that church. And that scripture says in 1 John 5, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Our job's not to decide what we want and then try to get him to give it to us. Our job's to find out what he wants and then to get ourselves into the condition where he can righteously give it to us. I know I can pray for revival because God says it over and over and over again. I know I can righteously say, God, bring revival to my church. God, bring revival to my people. God, bring it to me. I know I can righteously pray that. R.A. Torrey, the wonderful preacher of revival and 
successor to D.O. Moody, R.A. Torres told about a lady who when she died, they took her Bible and they found all through her Bible the little letters T marked out by a verse. Or in some verses it would have T and P. And somebody asked somebody that knew her, well, what does that mean? And he said, whenever she would come to a promise in the Bible and she would be willing to try it, she put T out by it. I'm going to try this. And when she came to a promise and she'd put T out by it, when God fulfilled it, she'd put T in P. Tried and proven. Tried and proven. Now you can you can try this promise right here. I'll pour water upon him that's thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I want to ask you, what's the biggest thing you you're asking God for? You know, there's some things God just doesn't do until we come to revival time. There's some things that we just won't don't have the willpower to get done until God sheds out his power or shows his power and we have the will to do what we didn't have the will to do before. What are you asking God for? Second of all, I see in this promise here, not only the promise of revival, but the power of revival. You see that in verse 3, the last part of verse 3, 4 and 5. He says, I'll pour out my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water course. And verse 5 also. There's power in revival. God has chosen to bless the concerted effort of his church and to bring in multitudes to his kingdom during the times of refreshing from the Lord. The old Southern Baptist used to have two times of revival of year. They would get ready for that revival and pray for it, and then they would have numbers of people saved during those, during those uh, revivals twice a year and lots of baptisms. Now, I'm for having people saved all the time, but I want to tell you there ought to be concerted efforts on the part of a church to have revival so that we can reach multitudes of people at one time. When revival comes to a church, there's new power. It's possible for an individual to have revival without the church having revival. But it's when many individuals at one time have revival that we have church-wide revival. In the revival before Pentecost, the 120 experienced the breath of the Holy Spirit all at the same time. I notice in Isaiah's promise here, some results of the power. First of all, there's, a ref there's power upon our children during revival. I'll pour my blessing upon thy seed, he says. Promise is not just to us, it's to our children. The greatest church-wide revival I was ever in, we had when I was pastor in Selmer, Tennessee. We had cottage prayer meetings, and God just poured out his blessing to us. We had the numbers of people that were saved. And, uh, but what, what happened was we cried for it. We begged God for it. And when God shed it, it was on our teenagers. It was on our children. Most of my children or several of my children have been saved during times of revival. I was saved. One reason I love revival so much is I was saved during a time of revival. Grace does not run in the bloodline. You know that. We don't believe in birthright membership. No, our children have to be saved. They have to be born again themselves. Peter said in that great passage, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And then he repeated this promise, for the promise is to you and to your children, and to as many as will hear the Lord our God. Many of us were saved during times. I wonder, how many of you were saved during a time of revival? Would you raise your hand? Any of you have been saved? Some of you were saved during a time. And by the way, that's getting less and less because we're not having the type of revivals we used to have. When multitudes, we used, 
to be saved. There's power on our children to be saved. Again, there's power of revival for numerous conversions. Look at verse 4. And they will spring up as the grass and willows by the water courses. Get the picture he's drawing here. Can you count the blades of grass? We're in springtime now. If you throw out some seed, the grass will spring up. You can't count it all. It comes up overnight before you can even see it coming. It's, it's come up. That's what he's talking about here. Multi, as willows by the water course, like an oasis in the desert, and little willow trees will come up around that oasis almost overnight. There will be a springing up of people being saved. Multitudes of them come into Christ because there's a drawing power, you see. How blessed when the people spring up and we have numerous converts. What would it do to the atmosphere of a church if you had 30 people saved? What would it do to a new converts class? Oh, I love a new converts class. They just sit on the edge of their seat and drink it in. They love the Bible. You and I get so used to it, we go to sleep. You know, we get so dry and dead. But those new converts, they just drink it in. I love to teach one. What would it do to a church if you had 30 people sitting on the edge of their seat saying, give it to me, preacher. Give it to me. I love it. I love it. That's revival. That's what happens when revival comes to a church. By the way, most, most of the time we have lots of converts when our churches start. The first revival we had at Harvest when I went there, we had 16 people converted. One other revival, we had 25 people converted. It's still possible. It's still possible. But it changes the atmosphere. But one reason why young churches happen is because we're desperate. We're desperate as a young church. We've got to have people to fill these pews. After a while, if we're not careful, we get satisfied, don't we? That's what Isaiah is talking about. I'll pour water upon him that's thirsty and floods on the dry ground. There's power for numerous salvations during revival time. Again, there's power in revival for total dedication. Look at verse 5. He says, one shall say, I'm the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. Another shall subscribe with his hand to the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. Revival wipes out apathy among God's people. You see, revival renews dedication among God's people. Follow it in verse 5. One shall say, I am the Lord's. Lord, I surrender all. Whatever you say, I'll do it. I'm the Lord's. People are called to preach during times of revival. People are called to the mission field because they're surrendered. They're surrendered, you see. And I don't believe everybody's called to preach, but I believe during times of revival, everybody wants to preach. I don't believe everybody's called to the mission field, but I believe everybody wants to go when it's time. Hey, there's something that revival does to us that stirs that spirit inside of us. It's total dedication. One shall say, I am the Lord's. Another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. Jacob was the common name of the nation. A lowly name of God's people. Revival causes God's people not to care what the world calls them. It gives them boldness and fervency in the face of opposition. By the way, if you've never been called a fool for Christ's sake, you're not much Christian. If your family hasn't ever thought, some of your family hasn't ever thought you're strange, then you probably never got a whole lot of Christianity. <laughs> Revival gives you boldness to talk about it. It gives you boldness to witness, you see. It do, you don't mind what they call you. You don't mind. you got... You've got a new spirit inside of you. you see. Again, some will subscribe, he says in verse 6 or verse 5, some will subscribe with their hand to the Lord. They're not afraid to put it in black and white. 
they get boldness to sign their creed. Like Luther nailing his 95 theses to the door, here he he took his stand for God and wasn't ashamed of it. Oh, for a revival that causes people to take their stand out there where it's needed. Where it's needed. Where they stand the possibility of losing their job. They stand the possibility. And by the way, you all know what I'm talking about. It's difficult out there in the workplace now. It's difficult. Again, one will surname himself by the name of Israel. Israel was the princely name of the nation. The heavenly designation of God's people. Revival causes Christians to feel like they're somebody Revival raises the reputation of God's people. It gives them a new name. Most of the time, Christians are the off-scouring of this world. They're good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden underfoot of men. But revival gives the church new respect. The world doesn't respect our doctrines. We don't expect them to. But when they see some drunk get saved, when they see some dope addict get his life turned around, we had two young boys converted in Selmer when I was there. That that was a small town, 4,500. Everybody knew everybody and everybody's business. And uh, two of the old hippie boys, teenagers and the worst ones in town got saved in our church. They cut their hair and they started wearing suits. <laughs> the whole town was talking about it. That's what happens. I mean, as long as we go around, it's normal. And nobody, and nobody much gets saved. And, and it's wonderful to have people saved. But when God begins to reach down and save people that nobody expects to be saved, that's when God raises. We, we get the princely name of Israel then. A prince with God and with man. There's power in revival. There's the promise of revival. The power of revival, I must hurry. Finally, there's the prerequisite to revival. For he says in verse 3, he puts a condition on it. I'll pour water upon him that's thirsty. And floods upon the dry ground. It's not the condition that causes God to send revival, but it's our realization of the condition. It's us understanding it. There are many churches dead and dry and in great need of revival, but they'll never have it because they'll never admit they're dry. They'll never admit they're dead. You know, I, I believe in having some pride in your church. and We tried to teach that at Harvest. And, and I, I believe it. We ought to be proud of our church. But we've also got to realize that even when we're the most alive, we're not what we ought to be. It's all who you compare yourself to, isn't it? Spurgeon said, to, if you compare yourself to giants, you're a pygmy. If you compare yourself to pygmies, you're a giant. Depends on who you compare yourself to. If we compare ourselves to the early church, we got a long way to go. If we look through history and see what God has done in areas and in churches, we've all, all of our churches have got a long way to go. Many churches dead and dry, but they'll never admit it. It's when churches get dissatisfied with dryness and get thirsty for the water of the Holy Spirit that God gives revival. God doesn't give revival to a church because they institute some program or have some dynamic speaker in or does all the right things. No, the one requirement, the one requirement He puts on it is we've got to get thirsty for it. Amen. 
we got to get desperate for it. The Laodicean church was the one that God spewed out of their mouth because they were rich and increased with goods and had need of nothing. Had need of nothing. What does it mean to get thirsty? When you read the Bible, you ought to say, what does that mean? What does it mean to get thirsty? Well, number one, it means to be dissatisfied with your hardness. Dry ground is hard ground. Dry ground is hard ground. When we admit, listen to me now, when we admit, God, my heart is hard. I'm hard. I'm not burdened for sinners like I used to be. I'm not broken like I used to be. I have no tears for the lost. I'm hard. I sit under preaching. It doesn't move me. I feel no unction to come to the altar and ask God to do something. I'm hard. I'm hard. When we admit that, the staggering multitudes falling into hell. I heard just this morning a million and a half abortions in America last year. We've gotten hard to that. The murder of a little baby. Do you remember when it all came in 1973 or 72, whenever it was, when it, how it broke our hearts? We get used to things. We get hard. Sitting under preaching, we get hard. Sitting in church, we get hard. Sitting under the best preaching, you can get hard. David said, rivers of waters run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. Jeremiah said, oh, at my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. He was living in a time when a nation was going under. So are we. So are we. I fear for my children and grandchildren. I fear what they're going to have to face. We get hard to it all is what I'm saying. Again, to be thirsty means to be dissatisfied with dryness. To be satisfied with my lack of enthusiasm. My lack of fervency. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We get dry. Our enthusiasm's gone. Our desire's gone. You have to push yourself now. Once when the will was eager and the desire was eager, you were eager. You couldn't wait to get to church and when you got there, you couldn't wait to hear the message. But now we have to push ourselves. We have to make ourselves come sometimes. We're dry. That's what to be thirsty means to be dry. By the way, why don't you tell God that? When you realize it, tell God I'm dry. A lady came to a preacher and she said, Preacher, I, don't, I just don't enjoy reading my Bible. And I don't enjoy prayer anymore. And he said, Lady, let's get down here and you... You tell it to God. Tell God you don't want to hear from Him. And tell God you don't like Him talking to you and you don't enjoy talking to Him. She said, I couldn't do that. He said, ma'am, you've already done it. God knows. God knows when we're dry. God knows when we've lost our enthusiasm and our heart for things. And do you know that the will, the will... My people shall be willing in the day of my power. That's what it says in Psalm 110. My people will be willing. Sometimes I'm not willing. I know I'm, I need to go do something, but I'm not willing. I don't have the will to get it done. Oh, but when God moves, when God moves on your heart, your will gets the power behind it to do what God has told you. That's why many times 
in revival, the first way it breaks out is you know somebody's not right with you and you didn't have the will to go make it right. But when God begins to move, there's all, all of a sudden a breaking down and a will to get it done. Third of all, and I finish, to be thirsty means I confess my need of brokenness. When the ground gets excessively dry, it breaks apart. And perhaps some of you have seen it as a boy. I saw it because our backyard didn't have any grass in it. We kept it by playing on it all the time. And it was back before the days where people kept beautiful yards. And uh, we didn't have much grass out there. And when we would have a real dry time, the old dirt would just begin to break apart after a while. It gets broken, you see. Scripture says, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. You ever been in a prayer meeting where somebody broke? I've been in numbers of them. It's usually a teenager or a lady, but I've seen men do it too. It's usually because God's got something specific on their heart. Maybe it's a family member in trouble or somebody about to die or somebody that needs to be saved and they come into a prayer meeting with a specific need on their heart and they break. And God comes down in that prayer meeting. God meets with you. That's what I'm talking about. Brokenness. Brokenness. What is that? It's a heart convicted by its sin. It's a heart condemned by its hardness. Brokenness is when the plow of God's word goes into the fallow ground and breaks it up. Fallow ground is ground that's hard that was once worked. It was once worked, but the plow goes into it in the springtime again and breaks it up again. Break up your fallow ground, Hosea said. It's brokenness. You ever been thirsty? Really thirsty? I used to work for, in my college days, work for a fellow that put up metal buildings. And we would work on the roof in the hot summertime, putting the roofs on of those metal buildings. And he would come up there with us. It was a small crew. He'd come up there with us, and we didn't get any water until he said go. And I'd get so thirsty in the hot sun. I'd get so thirsty my mouth would just get parched. And I would long for a cloud to come over and shelter me from the sun while I was working. And just to have some water. When you get thirsty for revival, that's all you can think about. That's all you can think about. When you get thirsty for water, that's the most prevalent thing on your mind you gotta have it you gotta have it and so it is with revival when our thoughts and our desires are centered on it as long as we're content to live without it God will let us live without it oh that God would send his spirit this week his manifest spirit to soften us to soften us Sometimes I get to the point, and I stay in the Word every day, but sometimes I get to the point, I just want God to speak to me. Speak to me. You know, Brother Cofield, sometimes people can't help me. They just can't help me. Only God can help me. Only God can speak to me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Fall fresh on us. Let's pray, may we? I want to ask you three questions. Number one, I want to ask you, can you remember a time when you were saved and when you were lost. 
Do you remember being lost in a time when you were saved? If you're saved, you ought to be able to remember being lost. How many of you can say, Preacher, I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved because I remember when it happened. I remember trusting Christ as my Savior. Would you raise your hand all over? I know that I'm saved. I know it. Thank you. Put your hands down. I wonder if there's one I couldn't see who would say, I'm, I'm not sure about it. I'm not sure I'm saved. But I know I need to be saved. Would you raise your hand? Is there one like that? Anybody here that if you're not sure, just raise your hand right up and put it right back down. All right. I'm going to trust everyone here knows the Lord. Let me ask you this question. How many of you would like to see what I'm talking about this morning? It's a desire of your heart to see at least one time in your life, a great moving of God's Spirit. Would you raise your hand? Thank you so much. Now I want to ask one other question. How many of you this morning would say, I myself am going to obey what the Spirit of God tells me to do this week? I'm going, to be, I'm going to be particularly looking for what the Spirit of God prompts me to do. Revival is when the Spirit of God begins to move and judgment has to begin at the house of God. How many of you would say, I'm going to, to the best of my ability, God helping me, I'm going to obey what the Spirit of God tells me to do in every service. Would you raise your hand? Wonderful. Wonderful. I trust you'll commit that to the Lord. And some of you perhaps ought to come to the altar and say, Lord, let me be able to see and to hear thy voice and to hear you clearly during this meeting.